Um, I want to introduce Bamsi Mutha, our keynote speaker. So let me tell you a little story. <laughs> I first discovered doc, Dr. Mutha during one of my many, many, many Google uh, researches on mitochondria after Will was diagnosed. His name kept appearing and appearing in all these PubMed articles. And, uh, and I thought, hmm, he must be important. He's, he's been around, you know? Little did I know, Dr. Mutha is a world-renowned mitochondria expert. He has made major contributions to mitochondrial biology and genomics. He's, invest he's an investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute, professor of systems biology and medicine at Harvard Medical School, investigator in the Department of Molecular Biology at Massachusetts, Massachusetts General Hospital. And he's also an institute member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. We are so honored to have you here, Dr. Mutha. And we cannot wait to hear your presentation on Lee syndrome. Uh, to the audience, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will get to them after Dr. Mutha's presentation. Thank you so much. And Dr. Mutha, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Casey. Just a quick technical, are you able to hear me and see me uh, properly? Yes, we can see you, yep. Great. Thank you so much, Casey, for uh, inviting me and to your foundation for inviting me. It's a real honor for me to be giving the keynote lecture uh, this morning on a topic that's very, very uh, near and dear to me. And the title of my talk is Lee Syndrome Research at 70, Sterling Past and Golden Future. I do have a few disclosures that I want to uh, point out on this particular slide. And uh, I want to just begin by saying that it's awesome for those of you that don't know this, this is uh, Mitochondrial Disease Awareness Week. Uh, and I can't think of a better way to sort of kick it off uh, on Tuesday of this week uh, than to be giving a, uh, a talk uh, on Lee syndrome. Uh, so thank you again very much for uh, having me. Uh, and hopefully this event and other events are just gonna increase global awareness for this incredibly important collection of uh, diseases. So this is the outline for my talk today. What I wanna do is I wanna briefly introduce mitochondria and mitochondrial disease, because of course, Lee syndrome is a uh, signature uh, mito disease. And then what I want to do is I actually want to do uh, a retrospective and actually uh, look back at the history of Lee syndrome, because having worked in this space for a long time, I think it's just incredible. Uh, and then what I want to do is uh, our lab has historically worked on Lee syndrome in multiple ways. And I want to just share with you a few vignettes over the years. And then finally, what I want to do is I want to share with you uh, why I am so excited about the future of Lee syndrome research and what I think uh, may be really, really helpful for uh, uh, enabling significant progress in the years to come. And so, um, uh, as Casey said, we're all here uh, because we are in some way connected to uh, Lee syndrome uh, and taking a little step back. Uh, what that means is that we're all here because we are connected in some way by mitochondria, whether they're malfunctioning uh, in a patient or if you're a family member or if you're an investigator uh, investigating mitochondria. There's uh, lots of reasons uh, uh, to be interested in this organelle. Um, and this organelle is just absolutely, absolutely incredible. I mean, this is uh, an organelle that used to be a bacterium, used to be a free-swimming bacterium one and a half billion years ago, and now resides in virtually all of our body cells. And it still looks like a bacterium, but it's not. Uh, it houses the machinery for what's called oxidative phosphorylation. That's a mouthful for, for you if you're not a scientist. But this is basically the pathway by which the food that you eat gets converted into ATP, the energy currency of the cell. And most of those really complicated reactions are taking right smack in the middle of the mitochondria through uh, a series of uh, uh, macromolecular protein complexes. Um, and so this organelle has a really interesting history. It looks like a, a bacterium. It still uh, maintains a vestige of its bacterial ancestry, it has its own genome. So two genomes have to be coordinated. There's a lot of chemistry that's happening here. One of the most interesting facets of mitochondria is that it's a very complicated organelle. And so its components, its machinery comes both from its own DNA. This is the DNA uh, that is transmitted from mom to child. This is a maternally transmitted DNA. And this encodes 13 proteins. But the nuclear genome, the genome that comes both from mom and dad, the, the big genome, uh, this 
is extremely, extremely important as well. And we'll get to that a little bit later in, in, in the talk. But basically, this is one of the few parts of the cell that requires two completely different genomic systems to be operating in sync. Now, as it turns out, um, there's a lot of conditions, uh, human conditions that are associated with some sort of a decline in mitochondrial function. And it's turn, as it turns out, as all of us age, if you, if you take mitochondria from individuals different ages uh, and, and put those mitochondria into a small device, you can actually measure their rates of ATP production. Our mitochondrial activity is declining as all of us age. And the billion dollar question in the aging field is cause and effect. Is it the case that this decline in mitochondrial function is actually driving age associated pathology? Or do you just have sick tissue, so you have sick mitochondria when you get older? So that's still a big unknown, uh, but this is declining in all of us. And, 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 and the good news is a mix of uh, strength training and aerobic training can actually send you back north on this uh, trajectory. Now, uh, while uh, this is a very common and relatively mild condition, at the opposite end of the extreme are a very large collection of individually rare diseases. These are rare typically genetic mitochondrial disorders, where typically children are born with a birth defect in their mitochondria, and there is no doubt that it's the mitochondrial malfunction that's actually causing the disease. And Lee syndrome is uh, one of the types of rare genetic mitochondrial disorders, and our laboratory is historically focused on these rare diseases. These rare diseases merit a little bit more uh, of an introduction since I'm the first speaker for uh, today's symposium. Uh, when we're talking about rare mitochondrial diseases, uh, uh, today, uh, we're talking about a collection of disorders that typically, not always, but typically impact this ATP-producing machinery. These can be due to mutations in the mitochondrial DNA or in the nuclear DNA. And one of the real big challenges is that these disorders are associated with a lot of uh, heterogeneity. So even though the defect may occur in the same part of uh, a complex, some patients will only have eye disease whereas other patients will have multi-systemic disease, and we don't fully understand um, this pleiotropy. And I think what motivates all of us, whether we're scientists or clinicians or patients or um, foundations, um, uh, we have zero proven therapies. Uh, and I think this is actually a mission that we can all uh, lean in uh, against together, as Casey was mentioning earlier. Him and so that's a very, very brief introduction to uh, mitochondria. Now what I want to do is I want to do a little bit of a retrospective into uh, Lee syndrome. Uh, and uh, this is an incredible story. And so <clears throat> the initial description of Lee syndrome was uh, 71 years ago. It was uh, about 70 years ago or so. And uh, the initial title of the paper that introduced the syndrome uh, was a bit of a mouthful. It was called uh, Subacute Necrotizing Encephalomyelopathy in an Infant. Um, and so this is actually what we now call Lee syndrome because of Dennis Lee, who was the neurologist um, that first described this case. And uh, I feel a little bit of a kindred spirit with uh, Dennis Lee because uh, he was a, a, a physician, but he also ended up spending about one year of his training in Boston at Mass General Hospital where I work uh, during his training. And so uh, I think it's really cool that uh, he spent some time in the United States um, at Mass General Hospital. And this paper is remarkable. For those scientists, clinicians that haven't read this, I strongly recommend giving it a, a deep dive. It's, it's a heavy read. It's only about three or four pages, but it's a heavy read. But it begins with a very modest uh, first sentence. The following case appears to be unique, and that no references to a similar condition can be found in the literature. And uh, in this case report, what Dennis Lee does is uh, he describes the case uh, of a six-month-old boy uh, that, as Casey said earlier, was, was perfect by all uh, measures uh, and criteria. It was developmentally fine, um, behavior was normal, uh, until about six months of age. Uh, and then Dennis Lee describes this case report uh, of a patient that, uh, this boy that ends up presenting to the hospital, and he had actually been well until six weeks prior to this hospitalization. And at that time, <clears throat> um, uh, although his early development and be behavior was normal, uh, his symptoms started six weeks earlier, right at the same time that his sister had some type of uh, upper respiratory infection. So she had some sneezing and coughing, and that's coincident when 
his symptoms began. And at that time, he slowly stopped crying. He became somnolent. He stopped sucking. Uh, and this ended up progressing to the point that it necessitated hospitalization um, a few weeks later. And at that time, he was actually found to have optic atrophy. So he's blind. He was deaf. And at that point, he was very, very rigid and uh, spastic. And unfortunately, over a three-day period, he actually became comatose uh, and died. And so unfortunately, for those of you that are familiar with uh, Lee syndrome, this may uh, bear a lot of resemblance uh, uh, to uh, what you're familiar with. Um, and so uh, this uh, uh, patient underwent an autopsy. Uh, and on autopsy, what was notable was that there was only CNS involvement in this particular case. Uh, that's not always true for Lee syndrome. In this particular case, there was only CNS in involvement. And uh, what was immediately striking on gross was uh, these focal bilaterally symmetric necrotic lesions affecting the, 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 the base of the uh, forebrain, the uh, uh, brain stem, the spinal cord. Uh, so all of these regions had these bilaterally symmetric lesions that were necrotic looking. And on microscopic examination, what was very, very striking was this massive uh, capillary proliferation, astrocyte proliferation, microglial uh, involvement. Uh, but what was noted was that despite this very necrotic appearing region, there was neurodegeneration, but there's relative neuronal sparing. And so these are all signature uh, microscopic uh, hallmarks of Lee syndrome that uh, we still uh, appreciate uh, today. And I love the end of this paper. Remember, this paper was written in 1951. This was before we knew that DNA was a double helix. This is before, um, you know, there's an appreciation that mitochondria could be uh, involved in uh, uh, neurological diseases. And so, in fact, the word DNA or genetic is not in this paper, uh, nor is the word mitochondria in this paper. But what this paper was, was a remarkable and first uh, histopathological and clinical description of uh, bona fide mitochondrial disease. And this paper ends with a very thoughtful speculation of the etiology. Was this viral because the sibling had uh, some sort of a viral program? Is it nutritional? Because Dennis Lee knew that thymine deficiency would give rise to pathologies resembling the pathology that he saw over here, but with some distinctions. Or was it toxic? And he actually pointed out that there was a few experimental medicines that had been given to non-human primates that would actually give rise to toxicities resembling uh, what was observed over here. So it's a wonderful, wonderful paper. And um, I think we should always uh, remember and be grateful to uh, Dennis Lee uh, for really launching this field 70 years ago. Well, the field has uh, advanced tremendously since then. I mean, it's been really exciting uh, uh, to have witnessed and to have been a part of uh, some of uh, uh, the advances in Lee syndrome research over the last 70 years. And so it begins with this paper that I just told you about. Uh, and then <clears throat> in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, it became clear that in patients who subsequently had autopsy uh, diagnoses, they had a lot of biochemical abnormalities. And so there was connections to lactic acidosis, cytochrome C oxidase deficiency. Initially, they thought that it may be a pyruvate carboxylase deficiency. Later, it was clear that it was more of a pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. So there are these biochemical associations that made it seem as though Lee syndrome may actually be some sort of a neurometabolic disease. Um, what was an absolute game changer and really distinguishes Lee syndrome from a lot of other mitochondrial diseases is um, the uh, advent of CT and MR imaging to help to uh, identify these lesions. And so now it was possible to make anti-mortem diagnosis because these lesions uh, have very, very, very uh, specific uh, appearances on things like MRI. And so that's uh, been really important in helping to advance the field. Uh, and then in the 90s, uh, you know, early 90s, uh, the first genetic basis of Lee syndrome began to be established, both in the mitochondrial DNA as well as in the uh, nuclear DNA. Um, and then in 2008, I think one of the really important and exciting landmarks uh, was that Richard Palmiter introduced an accurate mouse model of Lee syndrome. Um, and as of today, uh, as Casey said, uh, you know, there's greater than 99 disease genes now that have been reported. So today we appreciate Lee syndrome as being a largely genetic disease, largely a mitochondrial disease, because so many of these genes uh, and uh, pathways directly impact mitochondria. Pilar Miranda and uh, Missy Walker in my laboratory uh, uh, updated the uh, list of uh, Lee syndrome uh, disease genes as of uh, 
uh, earlier this summer. Uh, and as of today, there's 99 uh, bona fide uh, Lee syndrome uh, disease genes. Most of these impact mitochondria, in particular that pathway called oxidative phosphorylation. Either those direct subunits are impacted or other pathways that help to support oxidative phosphorylation are impacted. You'll see that there are some genes that encode non-mitochondrial proteins, but again, a lot of these are related to things like thiamine metabolism. Uh, those pathways basically help to assist a lot of these other energy metabolism pathways in the mitochondrion. The field is advanced. I mean, not only do we now have 99 disease genes, but uh, as we'll hear later in uh, the symposium, uh, uh, there's uh, quite the clinical trial landscape right now for mitochondrial diseases in general. That's what's shown over here. Uh, Missy Walker and my group uh, uh, updated uh, a list of the ongoing trials. They may not be perfect, but largely guided by clinicaltrials.gov or clinicaltrials.org. Uh, and so you can see that there's uh, lots of drugs in phases one, two, three, and four, multiple modalities for a, a variety of mito diseases. And boxed uh, uh, are the ones that are specifically calling out uh, Lee syndrome as uh, indications. And so, you know, now we're in an era where there's lots of genes as well as uh, active uh, clinical trials as well. So uh, today, uh, and I think uh, when the scientists and the clinicians are presenting today, when we're talking about Lee syndrome, I think most of us are adopting uh, the definition that was put forward uh, by Shamima Rahman and by uh, David Thorburn a couple of years ago in a very, very important uh, and influential, uh, I would say definitive review on, on this topic. Uh, so uh, I think now when we're talking about Lee syndrome, we're talking about an early onset neurodegeneration that's characterized by psychomotor retardation, regression with progressive decline, often in a stepwise manner with frequent decompensations, often with illness. Uh, we like to see these uh, MRI lesions that can impact the brainstem, the basal ganglia, or the spinal cord. These are what are called T2 intense lesions. Uh, and uh, we also like to see some sort of a biochemical defect in energy metabolism. There's a variety of ways of picking that up. And today it is so straightforward to genetics, to, to do genetics that we also like to see uh, some sort of a genetic uh, mutation as well that could explain the syndrome. Uh, and so that's what we call Lee syndrome, but often you'll, you'll hear the term Lee-like disease or LS spectrum. Uh, and these are uh, 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 cases where many of the above conditions are fulfilled, including the radiographic uh, and histologic. Okay. So um, uh, that's a bit of an introduction to mitochondria. And now we've done a little bit of a deep dive into the history of uh, Lee syndrome, which I think is just so uh, exciting. Now what I want to do is I want to make this a little bit more uh, personal and actually just share with you uh, you know, my first encounter with Lee syndrome. I've been working on mitochondrial biology for about 29 years at this point, but my first encounter with Lee syndrome as a disease was about 20, 21 years ago or so. Uh, and ever since then, my lab has consistently worked on some facet of this disease. And so I want to uh, turn the clock back a little bit and uh, share with you uh, a few vignettes. And so about 20 years ago or so, um, uh, I was doing a postdoctoral fellow at the Whitehead Institute with Eric Lander. Uh, he was leading the sequencing of the human genome. Uh, and I'd already developed an interest in uh, mitochondria. And I was very interested in the nuclear genome's contribution to uh, mitochondria. And at that time, uh, one of my colleagues uh, at the Whitehead named John Ryu told me about a disease that I'd never heard about before. And that was called Lee syndrome, French Canadian variant. And this was a form of Lee syndrome. And at that time, this was one of the most common genetic disease in the Saguenay-Lac St. John region of French Quebec. It had first been described in 1993, impacted about one in 2000 live births. The carrier rate was one in 23, and it was already appreciated that this was an autosomal recessive disease. Clinicians had just begun to describe the syndrome and it was uh, associated with uh, brainstem gliosis and necrosis. So these brain uh, Lee syndrome features, these patients had developmental delay and ataxia. They also had liver disease and facial dysmorphism, which is actually not that common uh, in these diseases, but in this particular form, uh, there was facial dysmorphism. And unfortunately, these children uh, were dying uh, in the context of uh, neurometabolic crises, somewhere between the ages of six months and 12 years of uh, age. Uh, and so this was a disease I'd never heard of before, but my colleague, John Ryu, whose, whose primary focus was inflammatory bowel disease, also took a special interest in this particular disease because he happened to be from that region and was interested in deciphering its genetic basis. And um, uh, what I think is really, really exciting about Lee syndrome is that uh, Lee syndrome, French Canadian variant, 
was actually the, 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 and I had nothing to do with the study. This particular study I'm about to tell you about uh, predates my involvement. But what's really cool is the first successful application of a technique called genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, uh, which is used to find genes for psychiatric disease, for neurodegeneration, for inflammatory bowel disease, for diabetes. This is the mainstay genetic methodology for common disease genetics. But as it turns out, its first successful application by Mark Daly and by John Ryu uh, and uh, Eric Lander was on the French-Canadian form of Lee syndrome. And uh, in this particular study that was reported in 2001, they're able to use this technique. Some people call it genome-wide association studies. It's also called uh, LD mapping. They were actually able to map the, the, the disease gene to chromosome 2, and in particular, the short arm of chromosome 2. And so at that point, um, John Ryu approached me and said, hey, we've been able to use this new genetic method. And we've been able to zero in on the short arm of chromosome two. But however, there's 60 either known or predicted disease genes, and we don't know which of those is actually the culprit disease gene. Can you help us? And so this is super fun for me because at that time, I was already uh, developing a real interest in mitochondrial proteomics, and I liked coding. And at that time, I really enjoyed taking all of the publicly available data and doing what's called co-expression analysis. So John presented we, me with this challenge, which is we have 60 known or predicted genes in this interval. Which of these may be important for a mitochondrial disease? And using code, I was a math and computer science major uh, in college. I was relatively facile at coding. Writing relatively simple code, I integrated these three data sets, and out came exactly one gene called LRPPRC, which um, you know, nobody had studied in the context of uh, human mitochondria prior to this work, but it was so clear that this thing co-expressed with all known mitochondrial genes, and some of the peptides from my mitochondrial proteomics work were also landing onto this locus. Uh, and so this became the culprit, we resequenced it, and we found the causative uh, gene in LRPPRC. At the time, this was a big deal. This is actually uh, a method that we called integrative genomics. It was the first successful application of integrative genomics. The Wall Street Journal uh, decided to pick up the story uh, and uh, is very, very exciting. And uh, what I wanna show over here is a painting that was actually done by the mother uh, of, of, of a boy and a girl who lost their lives to Lee syndrome French Canadian variant. This of course was a pretty devastating set of events for her in her life. Uh, and uh, she was a part of a foundation that helped to raise uh, some funds to support Lee syndrome uh, research. Uh, and uh, she did this painting. And after we uh, had discovered the disease gene, she actually sent to us this uh, print uh, of her uh, two uh, late children that were biking around this lake uh, as a token of appreciation for the work that we had uh, done. And to this date, this painting actually hangs in our laboratory as a reminder of uh, why the work that we do is uh, so important. What I'll note is that many people in this community actually underwent uh, genetic screening and have now successfully undergone pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. They've actually had uh, healthy children. So a very concrete uh, consequence and benefit of finding the disease gene in a community where the disease, this particular disease was relatively common. That particular work uh, as a postdoc reinforced upon me the importance of the nuclear genome's contribution to mitochondria. The mitochondrial DNA, which is sequenced by Fred Sanger, it only encodes 13 proteins, but all of the other business for mitochondria is encoded by the nuclear genome. And so some of the work from our laboratory over the years has been aimed at identifying all of these other 1,100 proteins we call the mitocarda, encoded by the nuclear genome that end up in this compartment. And uh, we used a variety of methods, mass spectrometry, computation, proximity by attenuation, uh, a series of papers over the last 15 years or so that have yielded this protein inventory. So out of the 20,000 genes, that's found in all of our human genomes. About 1,100 or 1,100 of them encode proteins that come and produce mitochondria. This is a uh, inventory we call mitocarda. This is a atlas for basic scientists as well as for human geneticists and for clinicians. We make this freely available to the community, and this has helped us as well as others identify not just LRPPRC but a number of other uh, 
monogenic uh, disease genes for Lee syndrome, as well as for other mitochondrial diseases. Now, um, over the last couple of years, we've shifted a little bit from disease gene discovery because this has become relatively straightforward using next generation sequencing. And we've now shifted our attention to biomarker discovery. As I'll talk about at the very end of this presentation, I think one of the most important unmet challenges for all of Lee syndrome research is the lack of facile biomarkers with which to monitor disease progression. This is super, super important. We, we need biomarkers uh, so that we can monitor disease progression, so that we can classify diseases, and so that we can quantify therapeutic response. A biomarker is something like glucose for diabetes. Imagine if you had diabetes. If you can't measure glucose, how can you possibly uh, uh, manage your disease? How can a drug possibly be uh, approved? And so uh, what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to use a technique called tandem mass spectrometry metabolomics. Think of this as something like a glucometer, not for just glucose, but for 400 metabolites. And our goal has been to determine which of these 400 metabolites that we can measure are altered in Lee syndrome versus controlled. And the study that we did was actually a prospective case control metabolomic studies of Lee syndrome French Canadian variant, the very disease that I just told you about whose genetic basis we had identified years earlier. We now partnered with Christine Desrosers as well as the LSFC consortium. And we actually performed a prospective case control metabolomic analysis. This is a very, 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 very carefully designed study. Although it was only nine patients and nine controls total, they were all matched rigorously for age, gender, BMI, activity status, uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and in this way, we could do metabolomics. And what was very gratifying is that on uh, principal component analysis, we could actually perfectly separate the cases and controls on the basis of disease status, not on the basis of some other uh, covariate. <clears throat> and so uh, what are these metabolites? Uh, most of the metabolites that distinguish cases from controls in Lee syndrome, as well as in other mitochondrial disorders of the respiratory chain like MELAS, are metabolites like lactate and hydroxy and alpha hydroxybutyrate. This is not beta hydroxybutyrate, the, the ketone body. Some of you may be checking if uh, you're on the Atkins diet. This is alpha hydroxybutyrate. It's a part of the transsulfuration pathway. We're finding that these tend to be elevated uh, in patients with respiratory chain disease. And uh, we can find other metabolites whose mechanistic basis we think we understand. And all of this is working towards uh, what we call uh, mitochondrial function tests in the same way that if you have liver disease for that particular organ, you have liver function tests. If you have a, a dysfunction of the mitochondrial organelle, we want to develop organelle function tests, a panel of tests that give us a facile readout of mitochondrial function that, that can be useful uh, uh, for clinical management as well as for clinical trials. So our vision for mitochondrial medicine is that from a single tube of blood, we can establish a genetic diagnosis using something like next generation sequencing combined with a triangulation on the mitocarda inventory. And that from that same tube of blood from the plasma or the serum, we can biochemically stage the disease. So now if we have a novel therapy that we can give to the patient, we can monitor objectively their therapeutic response. So all we need now are novel therapies. And so the last vignette from my own laboratory that I'll just share you with, share with you is some of our efforts at trying to identify therapies for mitochondrial disease. And about six or seven years ago or so, uh, we made what I think is a really, really unexpected, super interesting uh, finding. Uh, we, we did a, a genetic screen in which you discovered that hypoxia or low oxygen is actually a suppressor of mitochondrial dysfunction in preclinical models. In other words, what we found is that in cultured cells, other preclinical models where we can poison mitochondria in a dish, we found that decreasing the ambient oxygen was actually extremely helpful to those cells. And so, um, and so this actually led to the hypothesis that low environmental oxygen may actually be a preclinical therapeutic. But what I, what I wanna emphasize is that everything I'm about to show you is still in the laboratory. It's still in the preclinical realm. None of this is ready for application to humans. So I wanna just emphasize that this is still basic research. So this, this paper gave uh, rise to a very counterintuitive idea that, that low oxygen may actually be good. And um, what we ended up doing is we ended up testing this hypothesis in a mouse model. As it turns out, our field now has 
excellent, excellent mouse models of mitochondrial disease, including Lee syndrome, thanks to the work of Richard Palmer's group uh, in Seattle. In 2008, they introduced a complex when deficient mouse model that develops uh, Lee syndrome. So it's born fine, it's developmentally okay, it weans at day 20, and then around day 50 or so, it's very sick, it's uh, hypothermic, it's lost weight, and it develops these lesions on MRI that resemble uh, the lesions that we observe in humans. And so we happen to have this mouse model in our laboratory, and we decided to uh, see what happens if we decrease the ambient oxygen from 21%, which is what we're all breathing if we're in Texas or in Boston or at sea level, uh, and we decreased it to 11%. And so this is uh, 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 comparable to uh, places like Pikes Peak, Mont Blanc, uh, Base Camp, but it's not Everest. It's something like Mont Blanc. So about 15,000 feet elevation. Uh, and again, this is uh, we, we do this by diluting the air that the mice are breathing with, with nitrogen. Now, for the purposes of the video, uh, all five of these mice that have uh, mouse Lee syndrome are in the same uh, box, but two of them have been breathing 11% oxygen for the last couple of weeks. So if you see if you can guess which two those are. So I hope uh, that was obvious. Uh, the two that were running circles around the others had been breathing thin air for the few weeks prior to uh, that video. These mice ordinarily die at day 55 from their neurological disease, but if they're breathing 11% oxygen instead of 21%, that's what the survival curve looked like at the time of publication. In fact, if we carry out the survival curve beyond the publication, these mice survived to a median of about 315 days or so. So a massive, massive improvement in uh, survival, uh, uh, as well as not just lifespan, but uh, health span as well. And so again, this is a preclinical concept uh, that we're very, very excited about. So as you can see, uh, both when I was a postdoc as well as subsequently in my laboratory, we've been very interested in the genetics, the biomarkers, and preclinical therapeutics for Lee syndrome. Uh, so now in the final five to 10 minutes, uh, what I wanted to share with you is just take a step back and just share with you why I'm so optimistic about Lee syndrome research today. We really are at a hockey stick moment for uh, Lee syndrome therapeutics. But what I also want to end with is what I think is going to be required to drive the field forward. And this is where this uh, foundation and others are going to be playing an extremely important role. So um, I want to provide a little bit of context to me. Now, I'm based in uh, Boston, uh, and uh, this is uh, Kendall Square. Okay, this is uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is Kendall Square. If you just go right across the bridge, you're going to be at Mass General Hospital. So I have a lab at Mass General Hospital and at the Broad Institute, and uh, that's Boston. This is Cambridge. And this is Kendall Square. This is basically, uh, I would say, one of the meccas of biotech in the entire world. And if you just go back into the late 60s or so, this is actually what Kendall Square looked like. And it's because of the molecular biology revolution, a lot of work from academics as well as from industry, all of this blossomed into one of the epicenters for biotech. And so I feel very fortunate because I'm surrounded by people that are really innovating uh, at all levels to try to develop new medicines. And this is a great little video that was developed by uh, MIT, if uh, any of you are interested, on how the biotech uh, boom started in part uh, uh, at MIT, Harvard, uh, and in Kendall Square. I want to share with you um, some really exciting things that are happening more broadly. We are now in the era of definitive medicines for genetic disease. Uh, and so here's two drugs that I'll just call out that I think are really exciting. So Ionis developed a drug called Spinraza for spinal muscular atrophy, uh, a really, really devastating neurological disease. The gene was cloned in 1995. Very good basic biology identified what I call a backup gene in 1999. Uh, and uh, in 2016, a novel therapeutic modality, ASO, uh, therapies uh, were developed that basically reawaken that backup gene that's ordinarily not inflated. It's a really neat approach. Uh, and this leads to really, really meaningful, sizable uh, improvements in, in, in these children. 
another really remarkable story came from cystic fibro for, for cystic fibrosis. The gene was cloned in 1989. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was crucial for helping to uh, provide a partnership, both not just financially, but also in terms of connecting to patients um, and helping to support research both in academia as well as in industry. Uh, on the academic side, one of the most important things that was discovered was that the most common mutation for cystic fibrosis, it's actually a temperature sensitive mutant. In other words, there's nothing inherently wrong with that protein if you're at the right temperature, it's just that at 37 degrees, it unfolds. And uh, that provided a rationale for uh, the biotech sector to develop small molecules that will basically bind to that protein and stabilize it. It confers thermal stability. And this uh, remarkable trio of molecules was uh, approved in 2019 and is really uh, game-changing and literally life-changing for cystic fibrosis. These are both genetic disease. Genes were identified. There's really good basic biology. And the reasons that these programs were so successful, in my opinion, is that there's a really good understanding of the human genetics, deep understanding of the human biology, disease biology. They uh, made clever use of emerging technology. And importantly, in these instances, there was a deep collaboration of patient research and advocacy groups. And so I will argue that this is basically where, where we are for Lee syndrome. Um, so as of today, you know, unlike 70, 71 years ago, we now appreciate that Lee syndrome is a uh, largely uh, genetic disease. There are environmental triggers for sure, but at the root is a genetic predisposition, predisposition for these diseases. We have 99 disease genes. We understand a lot of the proximal pathways that are broken uh, subsequent to these 99 uh, genes being disrupted. And what's really special about Lee syndrome is we have excellent diagnostic imaging that allows us in a sensitive and specific way to identify these cases. Now, what I'll point out is that unlike those other cases like cystic fibrosis, major challenges that we face as we as a community try to take on Lee syndrome are the genetic heterogeneity, 99 different disease genes, and in some instances, some of those genes harbor a number of different disease alleles, so genetic and allelic heterogeneity. There's a lot of pleiotropy. Sometimes a mutation in one gene only impacts the brain, and in other instances of Lee syndrome, you'll have multiple organ systems that are impacted. And importantly, each of these individual genetic forms of Lee syndrome is ultra rare. And so these are some unique challenges that we're gonna have to take on as a field, okay? Now, I think moving forward, what's gonna be very important extremely important for Lee syndrome is a concept uh, that was really put forward by Victor McCusick, who wrote famously about the nosology of genetic diseases. And in particular, he, he described the notion of either splitting or lumping. And so if you're a lumper, you're going to take all 99 of these genetic forms of Lee syndrome and lump them together and treat them as one. If you're a splitter, you're going to break up all of those Lee syndromes with those T2 intense lesions and break it up into 99 different genetic forms of disease. This concept is important in some instances being a splitter is good and in some instances being a lumper is good. And so this is the high level schematic that I'll put forward as a concept moving forward. I think that in order to be successful in the future, we're going to have to rationally and very intelligently uh, uh, lump some of these genetic forms of diseases and then develop gene agnostic, say, small molecule therapies that affect that, that basically impact some of the common final effectors. Alternatively, we may choose to be splitters, which is fine, in which case what we're going to do is we're going to develop either gene replacement for the nuclear genes or down the road, not immediately, because this is still very, very early technology, but maybe uh, you know, five to 10 years from now, hopefully, mtDNA editing, ed editing of the mtDNA. So, so these are approaches uh, that could be applied to uh, individual genes and alleles. These can be applied in a lumped manner, if you will, uh, to target uh, common uh, effector pathways. Both approaches are going to have merit. Both approaches are going to be essential for Lee syndrome. And what I want to emphasize is that we are never going to have a single magic bullet for all forms of Lee syndrome. It's, it's, they're just two heterogeneous disorders, too many organ systems that can be impacted. Uh, I think for uh, certain forms, uh, uh, we may have magic bullets for individual forms of disease, uh, but not for all of them. So we're gonna need multiple approaches. So in the final one to two minutes, what I wanna uh, share with you is what I think is gonna be important for driving the field forward. 
first and foremost, uh, it takes a village, as Casey said early on. Uh, this is going to require collaboration. In order to solve Lee syndrome in a really meaningful way, we're going to have to all work together. And that ecosystem is going to include the patients, the foundations, academics, companies, regulatory agencies. We all need to work together um, uh, efficiently uh, and uh, uh, collaboratively. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize is that mitochondrial disease can wax and wane. And so this is a hypothetical natural history of a patient with Lee syndrome. Okay. So, um, you know, the patient might be fine. There's some type of a viral prodrome. There's a little bit of regression happens again. Patient spontaneously gets better for whatever reason. And then there's another decline. This is actually what this up and down stuff is actually what a lot of these mitochondrial diseases look like. We really need to have strong scientific theses, prospective natural history studies, and rigorous clinical trial design given this waxing and waning nature of mitochondrial disease. Because imagine a scenario in which you give a drug and you just happen to give it here. Right? Let's just say that you gave a placebo and you just gave it over here in an N of one drug trial. Well, the patient spontaneously got better. You may then end your drug trial and conclude from this end of one drug trial that your drug was actually helpful or efficacious. And if you're a parent, you may get really excited about what this particular drug did. Uh, and if you're a biotech, you may be very, very excited about it. But we have to appreciate that these drugs wax and wane. And we need to have extremely, extremely rigorous uh, trial design, when possible, randomized controlled trials, so that we can make sure that the drugs that we are pushing forward are safe and efficacious. And in order to do that, we're really going to need to have high quality patient registries. We're going to need prospective natural history studies for Lee syndrome. We don't have that right now. And I think what's going to be super important for the field, independent of the therapy, is we desperately need high quality biomarkers, whether they're blood based, I'm most excited about digital biomarkers to aid in clinical trials. Um, and uh, that's going to create a foundation. And then, you know, lots of folks are developing exciting gene therapies, gene editing for the nuclear genome, as well as for the mtDNA. This is going to be useful for targeting specific genes or alleles. So for the, the splitter strategy, we also need therapies that target downstream effectors for the lumpers. We're going to need both. And finally, what I'm going to argue is that any new therapy really should be tested in preclinical models. As of 2022, we have excellent mouse models for mitochondrial disease, as well as for Lee syndrome. There's almost no reason why a candidate therapeutic shouldn't be tested first in preclinical model. What I'll point out is that in that model that I alluded to earlier, just one of the mouse models of end of S4 deficiency for Lee syndrome, there's already multiple promising therapies. Uh, again, these are in a preclinical setting also, they require a lot of work, whether it's hypoxia, uh, whether it's a drug that targets microglia, rapamycin, doxycycline, gene therapy. So I think this is really exciting that we have good preclinical models and even some preclinical uh, approaches that are showing promise. Uh, and so if we, if we have this and we continue to always maintain scientific rigor and clinical rigor with the highest ethical standards, I really do think that we could see transformative medicines as early as uh, five years from now, especially for things like small molecules, and, and maybe uh, a decade from now when we talk about really cutting edge approaches like uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, editing. And so I think this is what uh, is gonna be needed for the field. And I think, uh, uh, Casey, your foundation is gonna be playing such an important role uh, on a forward-looking basis. I wanna just end by just thanking all of our uh, patients and their families. Um, I'm just showing uh, Abby McCurtain and her father, Greg McCurtain, who uh, run the Boston, he, he runs the Boston Marathon every year uh, to provide support for our laboratory and also increase awareness for uh, mitochondrial disease and Lee syndrome. Uh, but, but I'm really wanting to just thank all of our patients and their families because you are a true source of inspiration for all of us academics and others that are doing research in the space. Uh, and uh, we wanna be able to work with you to try to develop you know, solutions and therapies. Uh, and I wanna thank you for uh, all the inspiration that you provide. I also wanna just let you all know that there's a lot of us, I'm just showing my own laboratory at our 10th year uh, reun uh, anniversary, our 15th year anniversary and our lab today. Uh, I wanna thank all of my past and current members of my laboratory that uh, 
have joined me in working on mitochondria and mitochondrial disease. And if you're a patient or a family member, please know that there's many of us that are working as hard as we can to try to come up with meaningful medicines for uh, Lee syndrome. Uh, so with that, I will uh, stop and I'll field any questions that uh, you may have. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Mutha. I feel uh, just enlightened by by your uh, presentation. I will say that I'm a splitter and now I can appreciate the lumpers. So it is going to take, uh, like you said, a full uh, circle. Um, let's get to, to some questions. Um, one, this one came from Nikolai. Uh, it says alternating and appearing and disappearing of brain lesions are reported in literature and by parents. Have you found correlations between any factors, supplements, environmental lack presence of seizures and these disappearing lesions? Yes, we actually just wrote um, a little review article perspective on the fact that these brain lesions can be reversible. And in our mouse model, Casey, we that uh, we can actually take that mouse model to the brink of death, and then we can actually start hypoxia when they have advanced brain lesions. And after a few weeks of hypoxia therapy, we can actually make those lesions disappear. And so that's mouse data. But in a very recent paper that was uh, co-led by uh, Pilar Miranda and by Missy Walker from my laboratory, uh, we did a, a case review and there are case reports of patients that have T2 intense lesions. Their fever subsided, uh, you know, they just got better for whatever reason. And months later, the lesions disappear. So we actually think that there's an early part of the pathology that is visible to the MRI, that it's still reversible. And then of course, once the neurons die, that's gonna be hard to reverse. But we do think that there's very strong uh, case uh, reports and mouse data, data to suggest the reversibility of the early phases of uh, uh, the inflammatory disease. That is truly amazing. Um, we do have a, a follow-up question. Um, what could hypoxia training look like for our children? And I and, know we were in early stages, so. Uh, yeah. And you know, uh, Casey, I, I wanna emphasize, I really, really wanna emphasize that we're still in the early stages for hypoxia therapy. Uh, it works beautifully in mouse models, but it has to be chronic continuous hypoxia. One thing that we have reported is that if you do intermittent, it does not work. And in certain mouse models, uh, intermittent can actually even be worse. And so we, we, we really need to understand the biology of hypoxia therapy. And then our long-term goal is to try to put that into a pill. So I would say uh, we're not ready for uh, any studies in human patients yet. That's fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> um, Jessica, I know, I think you have a question that you'd like to ask live. So I'm gonna let you uh, ask that question. Um, so I just wondered, you know, the hypoxia treatment is really exciting in the animal models and the animal model you've used has, has variants in the, the nuclear genome. I wonder if you thought at all whether this hypoxia treatment might work for diseases that involve variants in the mitochondrial genome and have you tested it or have you thought about um, whether that might be an effective therapy also for those uh, forms of Lay syndrome? No, thank you, uh, Jessica. So I, you know, we haven't tested yet in any of the mtDNA based uh, models, uh, but I think there's no reason to think that it, it wouldn't work in in, in those as well. Um, at least based on cell culture studies and worm studies and other mouse models, the hypoxia approach does appear to generalize not to every mitochondrial disease, but a very large subset. Uh, and so uh, I think there's reason to be cautiously optimistic that it would extend to mtDNA models in a preclinical setting as well. Um, and just a quick follow-up question. Um, so with the hypoxia, did you notice any off-target effects that might result in you know, symptoms? Um, and if, if so, or if you haven't yet, have you thought about how you might mitigate some off-target effects? Um, being a cardiovascular biologist, I know the heart is really sensitive to a lot of... Um, yeah. No, so, and, and, and this is why we, we, we really want to try to get this right in a preclinical setting. And, you know, I think, you know, some of the toxicity to be concerned about with hypoxia is probably not off target, but on target. And so one of the things that we do worry about with really chronic hypoxia is uh, right-sided heart failure. So you can actually develop a cardiomyopathy and, and pulmonary hypertension. 
Uh, and so at least in these mouse models, uh, we're not seeing that as a, a problem. But of course, if we uh, once we try to enter into humans, uh, that's something we'll have to be anticipating and be very, very careful about. Thank you. OK, we have time just for a few more questions so we can stay on schedule. Uh, switching over to metabolomics. Are the metabolomic changes primary or secondary to Lee syndrome? How can we be sure they are primary? This is from Isabel. Yeah, these are great questions. We think that they're very, very, very early. We actually understand the mechanistic basis for the alterations. And so uh, but I almost we like to think of these as sort of uh, ripples and responses. And so as soon as you have a, a proximal genetic defect in one of those genes encoding the respiratory chain, some of the earliest biochemical alterations, we understand why, are corresponding to these elevated lactate and alpha hydroxybutyrate. Now, whether those are in the causal path to Lee syndrome pathology, we don't know the answer to that. But these are early mechanistic uh, markers that we're looking at. We have a lot of questions coming in and I know we won't get to all of them, so I will um, send them to you separately. And